<laughs> drums drums are red, bass is blue, guitars no, are green. No, bass is purple. What are you talking Be- about? No, horns Be- are blue. No, horns Lead are- vocals are teal. I don't want to hear this crap. <laughs> horn, hor- horns are yellow, dude. Because no, keys brass. are yellow. Guitar, okay, like <laughs> Key- keys are keys are violet, man. I can't, oh I can't believe goodness. we're arguing no, about no, this. Keys oh are yellow. Goodness. You're listening to the GWNL podcast. Guys with no lives talking about audio. We are doing our usual thing. This is the first episode. Where's the where's the DJ like? <laughs> <laughs> right um oh, okay. our first inaugural episode of this the sound cast with the sound cast crew the audio bros sound pros we have mr ben hello hi everybody and then we have mr bryant with the extra r and then there's me i'm joe i just i guess i'm i work i just work here I, I, just do. I just I just work here. So tonight's agenda of the podcast is a foundational, basic, wonderful, and we'll probably completely get sidetracked because that's the people we are. We are going on about the basics of mixing. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, okay. that's that <laughs> potential to get into the weeds tonight, kids. Mm-hmm. You ever you ever wonder what it's like? Okay. With that being said. We've got a few talking points tonight that we're going to kind of pull through. Uh, basically, game staging, the idea of removing problems, and then knowing your workflow is kind of the three things that we've thrown in there tonight. Um, and we're going to kind of go through those things and talk about them. And let's start with game staging. Who wants to take a first Ooh. stab? Who has opinions on game staging? Do you have opinions on game staging? Let's, or are you I, just bad at I'm, mixing? I'm, 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 uh, I'm curious as to Ben's opinions on game staging. My opinions on gain staging. Yeah, let's um, hear it. I think it's important. How's that? There you go. Uh, <laughs> okay, first, first off, first wow, off, what? Great. Maybe we should explain what is gain staging. Well, yeah. let's maybe we back up a teeny bit more and just. I mean, I know this isn't like super basic, but you know what is mixing? I think everybody listening should know what mixing is. But you know, we're having all the multi-track and and balancing all the tracks together. Um, but gain staging is like the you know obviously if you just have all the tracks there and then you just think about your faders you can adjust all those levels but the gain staging is it's not just one stage of level or volume that it's going through you've got the input gain to recording basically which is how loud your track is and then the gain of going from your your track level to the first processor in your in your chain path, of things in whatever. your chain yes yeah. chain and then from each plugin or each processor to each processor and then finally going through your fader and then from your fader you're going out either submixes or going to the master mix um, and so all those levels all those stages are your gain staging and um, I, I guess my biggest philosophy is right. understanding that first of all like knowing your signal flow is the most important thing. And then second is making sure that it's a nice cascading effect. So the example I always use is like water going through pipes. And so you want your pipes to just get That's bigger analogy. and bigger as it goes. Um, if you have a really big pipe that goes down to a really small pipe, you're going to have all this water squirting through, which is essentially distortion. And mm-hmm. so that makes sense. Um, if you have the smaller pipe getting bigger and bigger. And so as you're gain staging, just like, if you turn up that first gain too loud, then you're going to have potentials for distortion everywhere. So I think that's my yeah. biggest that's my biggest takeaway is that. I would add one thing to that. I think input gain should be considered your maximum and minimum dynamics. With your input gain staging, you have to realize that you're setting your full dynamic contrast for that source. And and having a good input gain like, again, it's that whole idea. You're talking about the yeah. pipes, right? If you yeah. don't have enough water coming, you can't make more water in the tubes. Like, yeah. technically, there are ways in audio, but for the sake of the analogy, you really shouldn't. You should, you should think from the beginning of building that dynamics and your maximum and minimum dynamics and understanding where those things are. If you have proper input gain staging, the rest of your, the rest of your um, signal chain will work better. And I think like obviously in the mixing stages, especially also we need to think about this from the perspective of 
live versus studio. studio. Not yeah. because live is so different, but because you have different affordances. That's the word I'll use that yeah. you have in live versus studio. But I think thinking about it as like that maximum minimum dynamic contrast and input gain is that dynamic contrast. Anyways. Yeah. I, th- I think that's something that's like really catch. Well, it's like really big kind of like a clickbaity title that people will use in when they talk about game staging on YouTube and stuff is, Oh, you need to make sure you have like your tracks need to be coming in at like minus 18 DB RMS. Uh, do you guys have any like opinions on that as far as game staging goes or like, well, um, this has been an issue for a lot of years, you know, um, when we kind of moved from 16 bit to 24 bit, it was a really hot topic. Um, because especially when recording at 16 bit, it was a lot more important to record a hotter signal to avoid the noise floor and to like u- utilize more of the bits and such as people will say in their discussions. I'll probably have comments about that, you know, me saying that. Um, but that was when we got to 24, everyone was still pushing like, oh, you got to record really hot tracks and a really hot signal. You got to use all the bits. And, and um, what I've realized and, and what I've come to was, it was always like the two thirds kind of level, like 66% of your, of your amplitude level, which really like that's the minimum. And then up to like 80% somewhere in there, which is really negative 10 to negative 20. It's kind of in that 18 range. If you aim for that range, that gives you a nice healthy signal. You're not like super low. And like, because if you get, if you record too low of a signal, then you have to gain it up. And that's the same thing Joe was talking about. You have nowhere to go with it, yeah. It's basically like digital zoom on a on a camera, but exactly. That. Yeah, I would the, honestly equate it more to like ISO and like getting the right the right amount so that you have the proper balance, like light balance. Yeah. I, now he's I getting think. really complex. See? Depth and dynamics. Fine. Yeah. Well, I yeah, work with complex. video. Dudes. All right, guys. I don't want to hear this. <laughs> I work with video all day. Everybody knows digital zoom on photos. It's just like getting pixelated. <laughs> but it's stupid. the same concept. Use things, yeah. Using analogies people understand <laughs> is such a pedestrian way of explaining things. <laughs> you peasant. Yeah. yeah. And this is why. <laughs> okay. All right. This is I'm why we have a podcast right with uh, Yeah. So this is great. <laughs> these um, three get people. Used to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, like. It's true. If you if you record really low level, then there's actually quantization errors, which is really just like pixelation. It's the exact same thing, um, and so and that, that um, manifests itself as noise. And so you know, if you boost that up, you're gonna have noise. And then uh, on the opposite end, if you record too hot, you're gonna have um, you know, the potential to clip. And digital clipping is like too super unforgiving. And, and so, I hate yeah. digital clipping. That yeah, pisses me off. It's <laughs> But yeah, so that's why I I just kind of aim for negative 10 and negative 20. And then that gives you the other problem that I've seen. And um, there's a certain DAW that kind of drives me crazy that the the loops that are built into it are all like really hot, like mastered level hot. And so as soon as you start putting it through any processing, it's like clipping. And so it's like, why can't you just do your loops at like negative five or negative 10. So I actually have some headroom to mix with. And that, that exactly equates to this discussion with gain staging. If you, if you make it too hot, then as soon as you go to your first plugin, as soon as you add some EQ, because EQ is gain, you're boosting the signal. And if you're right up there towards the top of your, of your signal, then you're going to start, you're going to, you're going to. So like, I totally didn't know that when I first started mixing and like, I was just like, you know, try to get as loud, like, (laughs) <laughs> like that whole bits thing, like try to get it as loud as possible without clipping, right? And so when you when you're taking um, tracks, when you're when you're recording and when you're getting stems and stuff like that, and you're trying to get them as hot as possible, like you said, you lose this headroom that you absolutely need because like once you start running it through your effects chains and all the other stuff like compression, um, equalization, and just your like even like series of compression, because like you know because we all do serialized compression at this point in modern mixing but yeah it was i'm now so much more comfortable with having lower level stems now than i used to be it was just foundational whatever gain staging it matters don't suck at it so we've talked a little bit about what it is and kind of some of the steps about it like do you have any general like have we covered any general philosophies because like you've talked about like negative 19 to 20 i honestly don't even think about it i just try to make sure that i have it was 10 like, to 20, Joe. Oh, yeah. whatever. 10 to 20. The big difference. The, 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 num- Are you, the number I threw out was minus 18. 
So yeah. close. <laughs> Whatever. It's, that's just what I've. That's just what I've seen online. Mixing is by science. A, certain certain YouTube channels that use a lot of clickbaity titles. Yeah. <laughs> well, so yeah. let me ask this question, just for me and my sake. Um, negative ten to negative twenty. Are you talking about the average, or are you just talking about bottom to top of the dynamics? I think that's cl- that's peak level. Or, peak level. So, so like the top. Yeah. Yeah, that's peak. Okay. Um, you know, obviously in your in your DAW, you, it's gonna it's gonna have the peak hold there, and so you can see right. that. And um, so if it's in between, that's for me like negative ten and negative twenty. And then there's been other things I've seen that kind of have confirmed like other things that have said the same thing as, you know, I actually never thought of it as negative 10 and negative 20. I just was like three, you know, two thirds to three quarters, which essentially is that exact same thing. Um, but audio, it, audio loves thirds. It does. It does. And Nature honestly, loves thirds, right? Yeah. And power, like, cause if you think about it, sorry, this is a side note. I'm definitely oh, no. sidebarring this. Oh, no. Okay. But like, you have to think about it and we're talking about gain staging and I'm going to use it with preamps. Okay. So you introduce noise when you're using your preamp by putting it too high. Now you can have well-designed preamps that aren't going to add or introduce any kind of like art, not artifacts, but like fuzz or extra sounds and whatnot. But if you're maxed out on your preamp, it's most likely that the heat that is dissipating from the components inside of the preamp are going to introduce sound and it's going to raise your noise floor as you're recording. And I think this is another thing where like that whole like 66 to 80% rule is super important. That like, like thirds, like oh, definitely. Yeah. Three quarters of the way. I never push my gear past three quarters. Yeah. And if I'm lucky, I'll run it at 50%. Cause that's the, I think 50 to like 75 is about where it's, where it's warm enough that it's, it's actually going to be responsive. Yeah, but it's not so hot that I'm introducing extra sound in, and this is like just as important. This is all gain staging, so. No, that's true, and that's uh, the that's the sweet zone, you know, on your preamp, um, yeah. having it like you said, twelve o'clock or fifty percent up to like three o'clock or seventy five percent. That's really the sweet zone where it's like that's the cleanest it's going to run, and that's what I was going to say. I mean, let's apply this to live sound. You know, obviously when you're doing live sound you're setting your preamp gain and you know, what, what do you usually do with that? Joe, you're the, the professional I'm the live resident sound guy. Live sound guy. Yeah. yeah. Cause they don't want to admit that they do live sound probably as much or more than I do. Um, <laughs> we, have to, I, I, we have to I, make I, you feel needed here, Joe. Yeah. Let's right. See. I have to, I, I accidentally ran myself into running sound this past weekend. That's, that's embarrassing. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I actually probably do do more live sound gigs. I don't know. Maybe Ben yeah. does more and it doesn't matter. Um, so when I run live sound, what I usually will do, what I prefer to do, but I don't always get the option is I want my faders all the way down. And then I want to set my gain based off of the levels that I'm seeing on those and do it silent and then bring my faders up. And they may or may not be at unity. There are some people who believe that you should set your faders to unity to zero yeah. and then bring your gain up until you're hearing it effectively. I used to do that, but I have found that I have a better, more full sound in a live instance um where i set the gain so that the gain is in a consistent spot across every element now on the meters is what you're talking about on the meters that being said i always undershoot because they're always going to play louder during the show especially if they're a guitarist or drummer especially if they're a drummer or a guitarist (laughs) or any instrumentalist or because even horn players or a certain bass player vocalists or Or every bass player Or anybody who ever lived, anybody who ever performed or recorded. Just like you get it. It's and realistically, it's because they get into the moment. They're just having fun with what they're doing. And that's what you should be able to let them do. Like they should be able to have fun, you know? But um, yeah, I always undershoot them and I tell them, oh yeah, I'm getting plenty. And I know that they're lying to me. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, man, I'm hitting this drum as hard as I can. Yeah, exactly. like, yeah, right, uh-huh. yeah. Now we'll see. We'll see at the end of the show. <laughs> I'll show you your levels. That took me a while to figure out with the recording, like with drums, every single time. It's like, hit it as hard as you're going to hit it in the song, you know, and then you get it all done. They like, do the full kit, they do the whole thing, everything's good. And then hit record for the first take, and it's like, boom, the first hit or the drop of the chorus, and it's just like red. And so yeah. it's just like, oh, next time. It took me like three or four times doing that to finally, okay, I'm going to set my game a little less. Than they're Wait, you mean you don't like your like snare just all the way in the red? Like I like it like 
at like in the red. Like it doesn't even have a chance to hit the green or the yellow. It's just all always green and yellow. If, if I can just get that right. constant clip sound, you know, I really want yeah. that fat snare. It adds a lot of like the buzzy buzz snare bite yeah. to yeah. the snare. It's really aggressive sound, you know. Uh, By the way, we're kidding. Everyone yeah. who listens to this, that is, don't ever yeah. do that. That's so, bad for your gear. Yeah, everything that Joe says <laughs> means the opposite. <laughs> yeah, don't don't listen to Joe. He doesn't know what Very he's talking sarcastic. about. Very sarcastic. Yeah, I don't actually know how to do audio. <laughs> he just Again, knows. Like I, said, I just work here. <laughs> he <laughs> knows what he's not talking about. So if you do the opposite of what he says, you'll be good. Right. Okay. That makes total sense. Work? Yeah. Should sure. we uh, should we break down kind of like the basics of mixing and? I know we talked a little bit about what it is at first, but we kind of just jumped into game staging. Do we want to talk about? Well, I mean, I feel know? like that's the first step of freaking mixing. Like, See? yeah, I mean, I mean, like we like we said, it is mixing all those things together, balancing them together. Um, I don't know. What do you want to add to that, Bryant? Um, you're like, should we? And then like. Yeah, we should do it. Yeah, yeah we should. Yeah. All right, what do we want to do? Huh? <laughs> All right, what do we want to do, guys? <laughs> right back yeah, yeah, yeah. Right back um, well, I th- I think just like basic philosophies of mixing. Like f- for me, like my philosophy of mixing is, I-, I guess I should just go through my like basic process of mixing. Oh, so like know your workflow, and we should talk about yeah. people's workflow, which is the third talking point that I put onto this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm so, for, <laughs> so oh, uh, for, I think before, can I yeah. interject something real quick before you? Yeah, yeah, interject. I think one of the big concepts I think is important is to understand that mixing isn't just about leveling like your faders and just like, oh, let's just put everything up on the fader and we'll move things around and it's everything will be perfect. There's so many other facets to it with things fighting each other frequency wise and then amplitude. Um, playing effect in there with dynamics processing and then of course there's there's panning and depth you know all those things that, that play in there to make everything have a space um, yeah but yeah like yeah. it's so much more than it's like i guess the novice would think oh yeah you just put it in the mixer and then move the faders around and you're good you know there's so much more that's like so much level more, yeah that's like, like level zero like like yeah. mi- mixing mixing is like it definitely like there's there's a science to it, but I also think it's like more of an art once you get to that that point. But when you're starting definitely. out, you're like, oh my gosh, there's all these technical things that I don't know how to do. Like, what is an EQ or what's a compressor? We'll, and we'll talk about those things in future episodes. But yeah, should we talk about workflows now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go. Sweet. Let us know your workflow. Yeah. So um, my ba- my basic workflow with mixing, I think the biggest thing that helps me get a good mix is actually the preparation um going through making sure i have everything grouped and color coded correctly to how i like and then um checking gain going back to gain staging making sure that i have like a decent healthy level starting out and then um i do so uh they call it like gut mixing basically i'll go through and i'll just do i'll listen to the song one time without doing anything and then i'll go back through and i'll in real time change just the faders and i try to maintain that volume throughout the same like throughout the rest of the process as i do my eq and compression so i don't want my i don't want to put a compressor on and all of a sudden make the signal louder and be like oh this is better but really it's just louder and so i think it's better if that makes sense you're talking about like mixing at a consistent level so that the fletcher munson curve like what you're hearing um, the equal loudness contour isn't affecting yeah your perception yeah. of yeah the yeah frequencies. exactly yeah that's a that's a that's a whole nother podcast in itself right <laughs> yeah <laughs> ah, yes, go on about that. Lunch and- i know we have some mastering engineers out there that would love to tell us about how bad we are at our job i mean <laughs> no, but, how good but like no how important it is i mean i know one specifically and oh gosh um who is really big about um making sure to 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 mix at an equal level at the same time within like 3 db you know yeah yeah it's, i think it's really important I actually after i talked with him about it um i tried to do that i actually got a volume a volume control a monitor controller that stepped so i can go back to that same point you know oh that's cool i should i should do that when i master I, but just in mixing just, uh, like so you do it in mixing for yeah, that point mixing, of what yeah. you're saying you know try yeah. to keep it consistent in, 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 in mixing, I do that, but I should also apply that to mastering. But yeah, I kind of anyway, have a point I do mixing and then another point I do the mastering at. Mastering. I'll let you go. Yeah. 
keep going. Um, and then it really depends from like from song to song though. Like um, if you have like a really dense mix, it's kind of hard to like get, I don't know. I, I was working on, I was working on a mix for a client and I felt like I had a hard time getting a loud sounding mix because there were so many tracks, which was kind of interesting to me. Um, you'd think that more tracks would make it easier to get a loud mix, but just to get everything balanced and sounding, everything sounding good on its own, but then also in context was really difficult because of all those tracks. Yeah. More isn't always That's better. why you just get just... rid of all the stupid doubles and stuff. And just... <laughs> <laughs> you don't were... need seven kick sounds to make a freaking <laughs> kick drum. <laughs> You don't. You don't need uh, eighty guitar tracks. Yeah, like why would you? <laughs> why would you stack twenty there, vocals? <laughs> there were like, literally like eighty guitar tracks. Oh my goodness. goodness. Yeah. Just, oh, and another thing on my mixing philosophy, I do not pan until the very end. For the most part, I don't. I don't like to pan until the very end because I feel like I get a lot better sonic separation if I save panning for the end. And then I'm, I'm a big. I'm like super big on LCR panning. So I'll only like, for the most part, I'll just hard pan left or right or keep it in the center. Um, I very occasionally I'll put things in the middle of those, but I, I very just much like disagree hard with that. Yeah. That's, that's one of those. That's another famous pr- uh, mixer philosophy there, Brian. That is, that is a famous mixer <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> Learned that from a famous, famous mixer. mixer. Yeah. It, well, that's funny because like for me, I actually, I do level and panning, like preliminary level and panning. Like that's my first, you know, that's part of the gain staging. That's, that's the first step is like just getting a really, really rough mix just so that I'm not like, when I'm trying to do processing, I'm not like, you know, screaming when the guitar like comes in as super loud. It's just kind of to get things like, you know, not going crazy. But one of my biggest yeah. things is to actually put off like reverb and effects till the very very end like like my i try to like that to me that kind of will muddy stuff up and i mean you can use those things to get more clarity too yeah um which if you use them properly they do help with clarity but my thoughts are i want to get clarity with everything else like dynamics and eq before i reach to reverb to get clarity and then it just is even more clear and more brilliant um, if I do it that way, that was what I found. But so that's my step is level panning, which gain staging is part of that. And then I, I like to do dynamics first, especially the tone shaping dynamics, you know, first round of dynamics and then EQ. And then, you know, then it's like, like more leveling dynamics. Um, and then I move on once I really have the whole mix good, then I go back and balance it again, which I know we're going to have a whole podcast talking about that. Um, yeah. so just giving you a shout out to the future. Right. <laughs> um, and then after that, after I feel like I have everything in the right place, then I'll, then I'll add effects. Uh, but that's my, that's my workflow. All right. Go. All 58. Right. I have actually two different workflows because when I work studio, I have to think differently than when I work live. Uh, when I work live, my goal is to get the, the uh, the performers up as fast as possible and get them as comfortable as possible. So I kind of have to take some shortcuts um, and I don't like it. That's why I like gain stagings first. I gain stage pan and then I actually will run EQs first because EQing can take the longest amount of time and is the most noticeable. Then I will do dynamics after that because I can always adjust and change dynamics in the middle of a show and no one's going to notice. Likewise, a philosophy when I'm running a live show is I'm addressing problems. I don't have, like, I wish I had the luxury of like the tool sets that I, and, and, and it's because I'm not working on as nice of boards or as with as much power in DSP as I would love to be working on. Cause you can have boards that can have like multiple EQs or, or like multiple stages of compression. And like, I can do that on my board to some extent, but not with the same flexibility that I have in like pro tools or any other dog. Yeah. Um, So nine times out of 10, I'm working with a much more limited tool set uh, just because of the nature of the gear that I have. And so I have to, yeah, again, gain staging, pan, EQ, compress, bus compress, effects. And effects are probably the last things to go on, but they will go on before the show. 
I may change my compressor settings throughout the show depending on the song. And I, I mean, again, like if I, like I, in a live situation, you kind of have to respond to the performers and the audience and you have to kind of be watching that. Like sometimes a little bit more reverb or a lot more reverb sells it better. And it might be a little bit garish or gaudy. Yeah, I'll admit to that. Um, but hey, those people are having a good time. I'm sure half of them are drunk, but I don't care. They're having a good time. Um, <laughs> When it comes to the studio, it's kind of similar because I, I like to start with gain stage. I'm, I'm like you, Bryant, where I will – I like to color coordinate and organize yeah. the tracks and stuff like and name and label them because like a lot of times I'm getting stems from places that don't have like actual names on them, names, but yeah, I know the numbers. Mi- mix prep is so important. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't really talk about that, but I agree that, that that's something I do first, get it organized. So Right. I mean, and like at the end of the day, it'll make your life easier when you just say, oh, yeah, because like for me, I always have my guitars are like a green color and I'll do it like different colors of green. And that's just how I do it. It doesn't matter what colors I use. Like, I think we all. Yeah. Yeah. Who cares? I do. I do do green for guitars, too. But the color doesn't affect the sound. Well, drums drums always have to be red. Yeah, I agree with that. (laughs) I don't know why. What color do you do your guitars? (laughs) Uh, that that's can, that's totally variable, but drums like always seem to be red. I don't that's know it. why. He's yeah. a podcast. Dr- he doesn't drum, do green guitars. Drum, drums drums are red. Bass is blue. Guitars no, are green. No, bass is purple. What are you talking about? No, horns B. are blue. No, horns lead are... vocals are teal. I don't want to hear this crap. <laughs> horn, hor, horns are yellow, dude. Because no, keys brass. are yellow. Guitar, okay, like <laughs> key, keys are keys are violet, man. I can't, oh I can't believe goodness. we're arguing no, about this. No, keys oh are yellow. Okay. Bass is purple. Some do- okay. I'm over anyway, um, <laughs> I just like I said, it doesn't matter. Different Some... shades of gray. Light gray, really light gray, dark gray. Stock, so, Pro Tool, stock Pro Tools colors, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. It's all gray. Um, okay, so like, so when I'm in the studio, though, I always set up my session, organize things. I don't run buses. I will not run buses in the setup phase when I'm designing everything. I don't always use buses and bus compression or bus EQing or like doing things in buses unless I'm like, oh, I've worked with this ensemble. I'm going to bus this horn section together and I'm going to EQ them individually and as a section. And I will do things like that to build cohesiveness. I think like anyone would, but I don't do that until I've already gone through. So I've done setup. Then I'll do my gain staging. I will pan at the beginning because even though I think you will get more sonic separation from panning later on and keeping it as a mono mix, I feel like you're missing out on thickening up the whole mix that way. And I like to have them pan so that I have more sonic space to work with when they're in their locations. Also, I do not LCR pan. I pan. No, and and there's a reason why. I'm just throwing it, throwing it down on you. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I don't care that Bryant does things different than me. I, I do it this way because so like when I when I pan, I pan things in relation to like the drum set because I don't like I don't always have the luxury of recording drums in a different room or drums in a different location, and so I actually base a lot of things off of my overheads, my drum overheads, and their stereo place. So I will agonize over placing my toms and my snare and my high hat mics in relation to my overhead mics as well as my left to right uh, my time on those things to help alleviate any kind of thinning or over thickening of the drum parts as well as phasing issues and other issues associated with like the drum set and and i think from that perspective of drum space then harmonic elements it's actually drums bass vocals harmonic elements and that's essentially kind of the logic that i use when i'm yeah. mixing right but i start with panning after gain staging and then from there i like to eq out any major problems i like to remove problems i like to yeah. just deal with the problems when it comes to eqing and other things like that so that i'm not introducing that into my dynamic section and so i always pretty much start with some form of eqing like that to remove issues dynamics and then actual shaping EQs, um, compression shaping. Like I, I think I like to level first and then shape. Well, no, I don't like to do that. It depends. It depends <laughs> on the element. It depends on the song. It depends. It's but like no. so, it, it's like so dependent on the situation. You're, yeah, it's true. It, it's hard. It's hard to generalize it all down to just this is mm-hmm. what it is. You know. I well, don't wait to put reverb and effects on until the end. I will put them on after I've kind of gotten a general mix, like balance and left to right panning done. But I will turn them on and off as I go 
because I want, I need to understand it in context as I'm moving through the piece, because after each phase, I like to go through and adjust my gain staging. Because yeah. here's one thing I don't do. Um, I save automation for the end. I try to get everything reasonably definitely, level. Yeah. yeah and definitely. then I will automate to create a more artistic move through the mix. And that's kind of generally my whole thing. And then I just kind of like flounder until I'm like, yeah, I think this is good. It sounds like music to me, I think maybe. <laughs> well, and, and get mad at it and throw it away. <laughs> that's one thing I've noticed that as I've, you know, done more and more, you know, over the years mixing um, is that I get more decisive. And I've had this discussion with somebody recently where it's like, that's one of the things as you get more experienced, as you get more decisive and that decisiveness will apply to like being able to hear what needs to be done too. So I can like, you know, one of the big rules with mixing and I totally agree with is don't like, you know, go like 10 minutes without listening to the whole mix, you know, like soloed in there. But like, yeah, I've gotten so decisive and like hearing the whole mix and knowing what I need to do that I can like solo stuff, and like work on the drums all soloed and work on this and that like for like an hour and then listen to the whole mix and be fine because I'm like, I listened from listening that first time, you know, I knew that I needed to do this, 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 and this. And so I went through and did this, 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 and this, and I still had the yeah. big picture in mind. And, and that's the way, like for me, the reverb just keeps getting, kept getting put further and further off. And I think part of it was that because I'm like, Oh, I can hear, what the reverb will do kind of in my head. I know what it's going to do. And I just, I'll just put that off until I have to do it, you know? Um, but yeah. it's interesting because there is no, it's true. There is no finite way. And I'll, I'll catch myself. Like if I'm doing compression as an effect, you know, I mean, you know, tone shaping compression. And then all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, this, this track has a lot of problems that I need to fix with EQ. Okay. I'll pause doing the compression. And I'll fix some of the problems, you know. And then maybe yeah. I'll go down a rabbit hole with that and be like, "Ooh, and I want to do this EQ too and this." Um, yeah. Oh, but, I did want to add one more yeah. thing into my my steps. So before I get to EQing, when I've done my gain staging and I've done my panning, I actually do focus on like pitch correction and time correction first, because yeah. you have that issue quite often. See, I'm 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 not considering that a part of mixing. Yeah, that's another I, debate right I'm, there. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm a like I I'm under the impression that. You know, you have your pre-production and then you have your tracking and then editing, editing. Yeah. and tracking and editing. I kind of group together in my own workflow, but then yeah. I get to the, then after that, when I get to mixing, there should not be any more timing or pitch issues yeah. in my opinion. No, I, 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 I agree. <laughs> and it's true. That does get, that's always my favorite thing when people <laughs> ask for like a group, uh, a package rate for mixing. I'm like, well, are you including editing and and pitch correction in that or not, you know, cause that makes a huge difference. Oh uh, so. yeah. I know I, I could, sp I, I have projects that I could uh. have spent weeks on because of the, the, yeah. Anyway. So we've talked about workflow. We've talked about gain staging. Um, let's see if you can, if you had one sentence that you can summarize your philosophies for how you approach gain staging and uh, gain staging and workflow. Um, can probably do it in two words. Yeah. Um, intention and simplicity. All right, Ben, what about you? That's really good. Um, I would say add to that, that, um, visualizing the sound of your end result and then going for it. And I would not add to either of yours because mine is completely different. <laughs> my, my philosophy is very simple. Mix good. <laughs> it sounds good then it's probably good because yeah honestly if it, like, if, uh, ultimately that's really what what like audio yes. comes down to and just, music and music in general like if it sounds good suck. it is good well and the, <laughs> the subjective part of that too is we all have different sets of ears so and we can't like let somebody else listen with our same ears and so that's a super subjective good, aspect. guys just don't Mix suck. good. Make it sound good for me. I don't care if it sounds good for you or not. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Anyways, well, that's what, when I do a live show, yeah. I'm just like, I'm just making it sound good for me. And, and hopefully everybody else enjoys the show too. But I'm like, to me, it's just like, I have personal control over the show that I'm enjoying. So yeah. 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 
I agree. Well, with that, that is the end of episode one with the Audio Bros Sound Pros. Nobody messes with us. We ain't no fools. Um, that's not how we're going to end it every single time. We're going to cast this out to you guys. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for listening to us. Uh, Appreciate we it. love like, doing audio. Like, subscribe. Yeah, like, subscribe. Um, get on that. Ring the bell. Tap the thing. Do the things. Win all the prizes. Mix good. Mix good.